when they're scientifically backed data, it's just more probable that it'll actually work for you. Hey, it's Lady Tina Leader, and I'm currently in San Diego, California. I was showing my brother who Jordan Peterson was and in all his wisdom. He was talking about the lobster's defeats. Now what they discovered is that the dominant lobster had a very big hippocampus. But when that same dominant lobster, let's say, gets defeated, that same dominant lobster's hippocampus in their brain starts to shrink. And at the same time, their amygdala starts to grow. According to Jordan Peterson, the amygdala increases emotional sensitivity and the hippocampus decreases emotional sensitivity. So let's say you CAT scan somebody with PTSD. It's not unusual that their amygdala is a little bit bigger than the average and then their hippocampus is smaller. They become a lot more sensitive. This is true in people with depression or ADHD and all sorts of other mental conditions. And the crazy thing is that the amygdala, once it's grown, cannot be shrunk back to where it was before. So the only other option we have is to strengthen and grow back the hippocampus. Naturally, I went to Google and I Googled how to make your hippocampus bigger. And here's what came up. Three ways you can make your hippocampus bigger. Number one, exercise. Number two, changing your diet. And number three, brain training. You might be thinking to yourself, what does this have to do with how people think of me, how I care about what others think of me? Did you know when you're in the position of being lower in the dominance hierarchy, you tend to care more about what other people think. You tend to be more sensitive to that because your very survival is dependent on it. So what does this mean? It's an indication that you tend to be on the lower scale of the dominance hierarchy. All right, first things first, how to train your brain to regrow your hippocampus. Hippocampus is responsible for the episodic memory. What is the episodic memory? An episodic memory is defined as the ability to recall and mentally re-experience specific episodes from one's personal past. Let's think wedding, graduation, birth, anything that you've experienced yourself. Three episodic memory exercises. Journaling at the end of the day. I want to be very clear. I'm not talking about bullet journaling. I'm not talking about goal setting journaling or affirmation manifestation journaling. I'm talking about traditional old school dear diary journaling because what this does is you're forcing a recollection of your day. Write down a beginning, middle, and an end. And bonus tip, include as much as your five senses as you possibly can. Another one is to watch your favorite show or movie, then retell the episode or story to a friend with their consent. No spoilers, of course. Try to remember the characters' names, places they went, and key moments of the episode or movie. If or when you dream, wake up and write or tell someone every detail of that dream. Bonus points if you can recollect anything unusual, unrealistic, or emotional. Quick PSA on brain training, especially if you're younger than 30 or you're in your 30s, because I know it's the last thing people want to do. First client who came to me about this, it was very shocking. If you don't already know, my name is Lady Tina Leader and I do public speaking, coaching, and consultation. Ever so often, I get these individuals who come to me who are naturally the most charismatic, most communicative, outgoing people in the world, and they have no problem doing public speaking. However, at some point in their lives, usually in their 30s, they run into a specific issue. They get stuck on words or ideas or sentences when before they never got stuck. By the time they come to me, they've already seen multiple speech pathologists, multiple professional psychologists. They're really trying to get down to what is actually happening. They do the exercises specifically tailored to them. All of a sudden that last missing piece is done. You come to think about it, of all the things that they've tried, they've also tried changing their diets, they've also tried exercising, and although that got them to a certain level, the brain training piece was missing. And also, if you wanna to go to my live workshop coming up, then click down on the link below because we can definitely get into this in our Q&A session. And then working our way backwards, this is where changing your diets really helps into different types of nutrients that our brain, in fact, needs. So if you want to grow your hippocampus, what specifically would you need? I want you to memorize FBC, fish, blueberries, and coffee. I don't personally agree with coffee, but let's talk about what's in it specifically, and then you can derive it from somewhere else. 
else. When it comes to fish, it's the omega-3 fatty acids that you really need if you want to take the pill or you want to actually consume that, which is a better way to have it in your body, but you do what you will. Blueberries, although blueberries are good for many different things, it's the antioxidant that we're really looking for. Antioxidants award electrons to free radicals in your body. And we want to be able to do that because that way it improves our memory. Because the better our memory is, it's actually just an indication that our brain is working properly. Coffee is in there just because coffee also have antioxidants, but I would prefer you to take blueberries over coffee because coffee has negative effects as well. Dark chocolates is also another one, but there is one thing that you should really avoid if you want to help improve your brain, which is white sugar. In America, on average, we consume 152 pounds of sugar a year. I am a notorious sweet tooth, so I know exactly how hard it could be. And we already know that white sugar has a cocaine effect on our brains, and there's been studies that's linking white sugar to early stages of dementia. You should be really scared if you notice that at this point in your life, no matter what age you are, you think back and you notice that your memory just isn't quite as good. At least lowering your white sugar level is going to do a lot over the course of your lifetime. Okay, let's talk about exercise because exercise is a very easy go-to. We can all agree that exercise has so many different benefits, but specifically there's been research done on cardiovascular exercises and its ability to lower depressive symptoms significantly, if not wipe it all away. And then if you just want to lose weight while you're at it, then great. So it's a double benefit. I remember when I was reaching corporate burnout, all I wanted to do was take walks and go on my stationary bike just to have something and clear out my monkey brain. But what I didn't know at the time was it was helping cure my depressive symptoms. And just one more thing that wasn't listed on that Google search was the psychology of winning. I'm a big believer in giving yourself small wins and celebrating that small win. If you getting out of bed is, is such a huge task, don't set the goal of brushing your teeth before setting the goal of getting out of your bed and celebrate that. Celebrate every single moment that you can. Often we stop celebrating these small moments, especially after really hard things have happened. And honestly, you deserve it. You deserve to celebrate those small moments because once you're an adult, nobody else is gonna celebrate it for you. If you're lucky, they might, but who is always with you? You're always with you. <laughs> so, so if you don't celebrate, nobody else is gonna celebrate. So kind of taking on that responsibility, that burden, so to speak, of celebrating yourself. I think there's something there as well. I'm not saying it's going to guarantee it, but it's really going to get you off into a very good start. You want to do it consistently, of course. This is going to take time, of course. If you're doing this for only one week, don't expect you to all of a sudden feel amazing. I want to set proper expectations. That being said, slowly but surely, you'll get better each day. Although there's a lot of video on how to not care about what other people think of you in a philosophical way, I wanted to give a perspective in a neurological way because I feel like it's something that we can target. And technically, if you wanted to do a CAT scan, you can actually physically see if it's working or not. I'm just in a big belief that philosophy and psychology, all of that ideology, theology, it's wonderful. But when they're scientifically backed data, it's just more probable that it'll actually work for you. So that's something I wanted to deliver to you here today. Remember, haters gonna hate and potatoes gonna potate. But comment down below if you are more than just a potato and you want to get out there, grow your hippocampus and be a better person because that's what we're all about here. I hope to see you on the next video. If you want more content like this, this is Lady Tina Leader. Once again, hit that subscribe button and comment below what you think. 